Hey Crossings, thanks for joining us today. As you know, we've been spending time in these gatherings hearing a kid's teaching from Rachel and from Ruby. And in our evening gatherings where we're in person and all together outside, Rachel has been spending time doing these teachings with us all there as a community. And I think this is really important and I hope we don't miss out on the opportunity that's in front of us during these times, during these spaces. I mean, for one, we have a chance to see our kids participate in the story of God as part of the greater community of crossings. You know, I think often we, we separate the adult crossings and then the kids are just kind of off on an island somewhere, which isn't who we are. Kids are very much a part of this community and we get the chance to see that happen every week. We also get a chance to hear Rachel talk about these stories of God to children. And uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer talks about how if you can't figure out a way to take the abstract notions of God and teach them to children, you have a lot of work to do. So we get the chance every week to learn how to do that. We also get the chance during these teachings to be mindful and prayerful uh, of our kids, of the next generation, and be thankful for the way God is bringing up the next generation. So I hope these moments are important to you amidst everything else that we do during these gatherings, our times of prayer, our times of study, our times of taking common meal. We thank you for joining us uh, again this week on this YouTube video. As a rise, strength of God, go before, lift me up. As a wake, eyes of God, look upon me in my sight. As a wake, heart of God.
Good morning. Have you ever helped to plant something and got to watch it grow? Yeah, blueberries. Blueberry bushes. It's exciting to watch a plant start really small and then grow into something bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, today we're going to enter into a story that Jesus told about something small growing into something bigger. Now remember, put your hands on your head. The adults have been learning about what it means to think again, expanding their way of thinking. And Jesus did this by telling stories called parables. Can you say that? Parable. And a parable is a story that helps us to think about a new idea or to think differently about how to act or how to treat people or how to even think about God. And these parables... These stories teach us how to think about things in new ways. And so I'm going to move our screen down again. We've been using these gold boxes to represent parables. Now remember, because it's gold, it must be pretty precious. So what's inside must That's be pretty precious, precious too. Precious. Yeah. And it looks like a present because a parable is also like a present. It's like a gift to us. And it has a lid because sometimes parables can seem really hard to open. But the thing about a parable is you can come to it again and again and again until it opens up to you. So let's look inside to see what we have today. Today we have a big yellow cloth. That could be sand. Could be sand. I do wonder what this could be. Now remember, Jesus did so many amazing things, said wonderful things that people wanted to be close to him and follow him. And he always talked about this thing called the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God was not like a place that they lived. It was not like a country that any of them had ever visited. And it wasn't um, like anything they'd ever heard about. So they always ask, what is this kingdom of God like? And so one day Jesus said, the kingdom of God is um, like when a person takes out the tiniest of seeds. Now there's a little tiny seed in there. Do you see it? That's a mustard seed. Hey, mom, that's your necklace. That is my necklace. If you take the tiniest of seeds... It's a grain of mustard seed, a seed so small that if my finger, you would, if it was on my finger, you wouldn't be able to see it. So it's like a person that takes a mustard seed and the person puts it into the ground and you can't even see it. But then suddenly it turns into grass. A big plant, right? A big, big plot. Yeah. I'm going to tie this around it. Oh, no. Just leave that there right now. Might be the man. Sure. Woman. And it begins to grow. Until suddenly, it got so big, like a little tree, that the birds of the air start to come. And they make all of their nests there. Oh, that's so sweet. And they come to live there. Oh. Any. Now, I wonder why someone would plant such a tiny little seed. And then it turned gigantic. Yeah, maybe they believed it was the source of life, right? Whoa. And it could turn into something bigger and beautiful. I wonder if the person who put the tiny seed into the ground had a name. Um, and I wonder, what, I wonder what this tree could really be. A gigantic bird nest place. And I wonder what these nests could be. They could be nests. 
And I wonder if you have ever done a small act of kindness and wondered if it ever made a difference. And I wonder what Jesus was trying to teach us about this kingdom of God through this parable. Now there's an image that will come up on your screen that we've been using every week. With the rings. So with the rings and those circles represent heaven and earth. Because Jesus keeps trying to offer this message of love this kingdom of God to all people. And this kingdom of God would begin with small acts of love and faith with the promise of growing into something bigger and grander and more beautiful than what they could imagine. So let's pray. God, thank you for teaching and modeling for us that change happens through small actions of love and courage grown through faith in you. Let us see your kingdom grow to provide a refuge for all who are hurting. And in Jesus' name, amen. Shalom. So a few years ago, Mark gave a teaching, I think it was during our prophet's teaching series where he, he talked about the life and the faith of an author, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, I don't know if there's any Flannery O'Connor fans out there. I'd be curious to hear what it is you like and appreciate about her work. I wouldn't call myself a fan of Flannery O'Connor. It mostly just gives me bad dreams, um, but she's super interesting to me. So Flannery O'Connor is this gothic writer. She writes novels and short stories. Um, she's a Southern girl. She was born and raised in Georgia and died of lupus at age 39. Flannery O'Connor was a devout Catholic, so her faith influenced much of what she wrote and how she saw the world. I actually think a lot of people are intrigued by Flannery O'Connor because of this. We have uh, some artists in our community who have a band, Hotshot Freight Train, who talk about Flannery O'Connor in their concerts and wrote a song about one of her writings. But this past week, our friend Michael Frost wrote a blog post about Flannery O'Connor and how a lot of Christians, a lot of uh, people in the world, talk about God turning up in their lives. Like God shows up, and then, then people describe this moment of comfort, this experience of God's tender presence. But Mike Frost says, but instead, grace can be a real B word, an unwanted, unsettling moment of clarity, in which hope and healing is offered, but not in the way we expected or even wanted. And he looked at the way Flannery O'Connor presents God's grace or God's presence in her writings. Flannery O'Connor even said that the reader wants his grace warm and binding, not dark and disruptive. So in her stories, A Good Man is Hard to Find, grace appears right before a serial killer strikes. In Parker's Back, grace is woven through a strange tale of domestic violence. In the violent bared away, grace appears as a great forest fire. And you know, we're in this teaching series called Think Again, and this idea that the life and death and resurrection of Christ, if, if it's true, then there's a good chance we're going to have to rethink how we think and how we believe and how we behave. Flannery O'Connor's stories do this. They make people totally think again about the presence and the grace of God. This is on the screen. Flannery O'Connor told of this disruptive grace. In her world, grace jolts us out of our indifference and makes us reconsider the meaning of the incarnation and the reality of redemption. God doesn't tap us gently on the shoulder or whisper quietly in our ear. He pulls the rug right out from under us. So there's this phrase we use often, uh, the mission of God or, or missio Dei. And it is a popular phrase these days. There are all kinds of movements and networks helping people um, train and be pushed out to join in God's mission, to join in the restoration, the renewal of all things. Every fall, we do a cohort called Forge that does this. But what I'm afraid is happening is that this phrase is becoming interpreted primarily uh, as having more to do with our part of God's mission. Basically, I'm afraid that the term mission of God has started to mean more about our mission and us than about God and God's mission. So more about the missio and less about the day. 
You know, there's, there's another phrase that we've used a lot that reminds us of how this actually works. And that phrase is, it's, it's, not, the, it's not the church that has a mission. It's the mission of God that has a church. So keep this in mind as we enter into the text today. Today we're in Acts chapter 10. I actually think Acts chapter 10 might be one of the most prominent stories in scripture where God clearly and directly asks someone to think again, to rethink how they've always known and done things. So Acts chapter 10, this is probably, we think maybe 10 to 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Here's how it starts. This is on the screen. Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and a member of a unit called the Italian cohort, lived in Caesarea. Cornelius was an outsider, but he was a devout man, a God-fearing fellow with a God-fearing family. He consistently and generously gave to the poor, and he practiced constant prayer to God. So Cornelius is this high-ranking official. He was a non-Jew who believed in God and respected the teachings of the Jews. It's like he was on the outside of Judaism, but he was pressing his nose hard against the glass looking in. Let's keep going on the screen. Verse 3. One afternoon at about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. So he does. <laughs> Cornelius sends some men to Joppa about 32 miles down the shore to meet Peter. And if this is a movie, the camera backs up and fast forward to Peter. What's going on with Peter at this exact same time? Verse 9 is on the screen. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey, these are Cornelius's men, and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened up and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter kill and eat. I mean, this might be like a normal dream for some of us. I don't know, but, but Peter is Jewish and killing and eating the animals on that sheet would have been complete violation of Old Testament law. In Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, it was very clear what he could and couldn't eat. And, and we don't have time to go into all of the details of the dietary law here, but this would have been a direct contradiction to everything he had grown up with. I mean, one of, one of the major points of these Old Testament food laws is it's not that Jews just weren't allowed to eat pork. The food laws served to mark out the Jewish people from their non-Jewish neighbors, which kept Jews from eating together with non-Jews. And it was the point was to set them apart. N.T. Wright says it so well, this quote's on the screen. He says, the reasoning was clear. The people you sit down and eat with are family. But the Jewish family has been called by God to be separate, to bear witness to his special love and grace to the world, and must therefore not compromise with the world. So it's not like these food laws were just outdated and, and legalistic. These food laws were a matter of identity and survival of a people group, of a community, of a, of a tradition. So Peter was on the roof and saw this sheet descend with this unclean food on it. And I don't know, maybe Peter thought this was a test. That's probably what I would think. And he says, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is profane or, or unclean. Like, sweet, I'm finally going to get this one right. But the voice said to him a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happens three times. And then the thing was taken up into heaven. Peter said no three times, and if you know the history of Peter, he doesn't have a great track record of, of things that happen three times. What God is doing here is, is this taboo of certain foods that were to keep Israel separate was now being modified to include the non-Jews. This is not a small deal. Peter was being asked to rethink the dietary laws that he had always known. 
and how these dietary laws may or may not be serving the purpose of God's intending them to serve right now. And most of all, God was preparing Peter for something that was about to happen when some guests sent by Cornelius arrived. God was doing something here to signal to Peter that the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, all can be welcomed at a table, no matter who they are or how they've traditionally been excluded. So Peter woke up or something. The next verse, verse 17, this is on the screen. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, I wake up and am puzzled about the dreams I have. At this time, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. So they were, they were standing by the gate because they were not allowed to enter the house of a Jew. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Look, three men are searching for you. Get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What's the reason for your coming? And they answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation was directed by a holy angel to send for you, to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. Okay, I don't imagine Peter was like, yeah, sure, of course, come in. I mean, so much about that line that Peter invited them in and gave them lodging, that was scandalous. It was against all the rules Peter had grown up with. But God gave Peter this vision, and because of it, Peter had started to already unlearn and relearn. Peter was understanding that because of the life and death and resurrection of Christ, everything was changing. So then Peter goes to Cornelius' house, and, and many people had gathered, hoping that he would show up. And in verse 28, Peter said to them, and you know, P Peter's people skills are real good here. He says, You're, you yourselves know that it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. So it's like, you know, I'm not supposed to be here. I should be calling you profane. And like, you know, I'm going against Jewish practice by being here, right? But Peter says this, he says, God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. Peter says, I'm doing this because I think God told me to. And Peter asks Cornelius why these men were sent to his house in the first place. And Cornelius talks about his vision and says, I think God told me to. And Peter says to Cornelius, perhaps with tears in his eyes, exactly what God is asking him to think again about. Verse 34 is on the screen. Peter says to Cornelius, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right and acceptable is acceptable to him. So the Greek translation in the Old Testament, this term no partiality, translates to lift up the face of someone. So in this culture, when one would bow their head when greeting like a superior, uh, the superior could actually lift up the person's face and that meant that that person was fully accepted. God lifts up every person's face. God shows no partiality. This is good news. And this story gets crazier. Cornelius' family is then baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And I think of it like a Flannery O'Connor story. I mean, there's probably more blood and death in the Flannery O'Connor version. But in this story, grace is not like stumbled upon or gently tapping someone on the shoulder. The grace and love of God here is like a rug being pulled out from under Peter. That's, that's how I imagine it. Peter was asked to think and rethink all that he had was known and believed when it came to God's mission for the world. And God was not asking Peter to just throw everything out the window. The grace and mission of God just looked a little different now. And God had gone ahead of Peter and gone ahead of Cornelius to show them the way forward. 
I had a similar thing happen to me the other day. I was trying to get my three-year-olds across a, a busy street. And I realized in the middle of this moment, I, I was standing on the side of the road saying, stop, wait, don't move, don't go yet, stand still, stay here. And then moments later, when the light turned, I said, now go, walk fast, hurry, go, go, go. Wait, so is it wait or is it like stand still? Or is it like walk fast or is it like don't walk at all? I, I mean, I wasn't contradicting myself in that moment. The child might appear, have appeared that I was contradicting myself, but the initial command they gave was right and appropriate for the time. If, and if I hadn't changed the command, we wouldn't have made it across the road. One of the most astounding things I find in this story is the way God was way ahead of everyone, giving directions that may have seemed to contradict themselves in, in Peter and Cornelius' mind. But in theory and in action, God had gone ahead of Cornelius to prepare Peter for what was about to happen. And God was ahead of Peter, giving him this dream so that there would be no doubt in anyone's mind that this call to thinking again, that this call to think again was indeed the grace and presence of God. There's a term for this. We've used it before, maybe on a Sunday morning. We talk about it all the time in our Forge cohort. It's called prevenient grace. So grace that is pre, before, and veneer, coming. Grace that comes before. Grace that goes before and after, for that matter. When we think about the way God is inviting us to participate in the mission of God, to participate in shalom, the healing of the world, the restoration of the world, when we think about the way God is calling us to participate in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in all the places we find ourselves, in what way has God been way ahead of us the whole time? Preparing the way for shalom, the way God intends things to be. I mean, the activity of God, the presence of God, the grace of God is not confined to the church and church activities. I think we know that, but do we act like that? Or, or do we carry with us a certain anxiety, a certain responsibility, that if we don't say the right things or act the right way or come with the right people or go to the wrong places, we will have somehow left God out as if we carry God around with us in our purse or our wallet. I mean, a life of ministry, which I believe is a life we are all called to, it's not about human ingenuity. It's not about what we can do for God. It's about discovering what God is already doing. And then in light of our gifts and our resources, discerning how we're to join in. You know, Mark wrote a book uh, with Alan Hirsch called Reformation. And the two of them, along with Brad Briscoe, talk about this. And they say one of the terrifying conclusions that grips the church in the West is this concept that somehow we've got God in our back pocket. Many believe either implicitly or explicitly that somehow we transport God like a commodity and we take God with us wherever we go. The assumption is that he just arrives on the scene when we get there and not before. I hope that this reminder that God is on the scene before us is good news. I mean, I hope it's exciting, actually. Like with Peter, it means we find God in the places we never expected God to be. It means we find God with the people we never imagined to find God with. And frankly, it means the pressure's off. That God has, has gone ahead. Grace has gone ahead before us. God is at work in the world, whether or not we see it or believe it. Will Willimon is a theologian and professor at Duke, and he says this about Acts 10, about this story of Peter and Cornelius, and this is gonna be on the screen. If Jesus Christ is Lord, then the church has the adventurous task of penetrating new areas of his Lordship, expecting surprises and new implications of the gospel, which cannot be explained on any basis other than our Lord has shown us something we could not have seen on our own. This does not mean an undisciplined flight of fancy 
into our own bold new ideas or pitiful effort to catch the wind of the latest trend in culture under the guise of seeking new revelation. Rather, it means that we are continuing to penetrate the significance of the scriptural witness that Jesus Christ is Lord and to be faithful to divine prodding. And he says this, faith, when it comes down to it, is often our breathless attempt to keep up with the redemptive activity of God, to keep asking ourselves, what is God doing? Where on earth is God going now? So in light of Acts chapter 10, in light of this incredible story of Peter and Cornelius and this sheet of food that Peter has falling before him that he initially was told was off limits, but is now being used as a primary tool to extend the kingdom of God. In light of this story, what might we think again? Might we think again about where God is? Might we think again about the ways in which God has gone ahead of us everywhere we go? May we think again about the way God is inviting us into relationships and at dinner tables with people we may have never thought we would share meals with. And speaking of sharing a meal, you can get out your common meal elements, whatever you have. You know, Flannery O'Connor at one point in her life started writing down her prayers and her prayers went something like this. My dear God, <laughs> how stupid we people are until you give us something. Even in praying, it is you who have to pray in us. I would like to write a beautiful prayer, but I have nothing to do it from. There is a whole sensible world around me that I should be able to turn to your praise, but I can't do it. Yet at some inspired moment, when I may possibly be thinking of floor wax or pigeon eggs, the opening of a beautiful prayer may come up from my subconscious and lead me to write something exalted. You know, Brad reminded me this week that at our outdoor gatherings, we've been using those like sterilized plastic sealed cups. Um, I call them the stupid sealed sterilized plastic cups that were like cleverly designed to hold like a styrofoam cracker. And Brad reminded me this week that, that those will stay stupid, sealed, sterilized little cups until God gives us something to do with them together each week. And that when it comes to common meal, the Lord's Supper, God is no less in these stupid, sealed, sterilized plastic cups than God is in this beautiful, warm, steaming bread that I imagine Jesus broke the night he told us that we should keep doing this. So when you are ready, we invite you to take this bread and this juice, the body and the blood of Christ, all are welcome to this table. God shows no partiality. May your face be lifted up in full acceptance. There is strength within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our morning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting, sanctifying us. When beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood As you are faithful forever Perfect in love You are sovereign over us You are 
Thank you so much for gathering with us on this day. Wherever you are, uh, we have just a few things that we would like for you to know before we send each other off into our various spaces. The first is if you would like to partner your resources with the mission of God that is happening through crossings, uh, you can do so in one of two ways. The first would be to mail a check into the office, and the second would be to give online at Crossings Knoxville. Uh, dot com. Our address for the office is also on that website, so uh, the website is just a good directive from, from that perspective. The second thing is we always have groups that are happening at crossings, whether it's a small group or a Bells group, and if you have questions about what that is, um, the website will also answer that. Uh, and also ways to just get involved um, in, in different ways of being in community, uh, whether it's modeled after a certain affinity or a passion um, or a certain gifting or skill set. There are always groups that we're looking to start. If you have a question about how to uh, get more involved in our community through groups, just email molly at molly at crossingsknoxville.com. The third thing is we're going to have a greenhouse gathering next Saturday, June 5th at 9 a.m. There's not very many details at this point about what that gathering is going to look like or even where it's going to be. So we will get details to you this week sometime um, so that you can begin to plan accordingly. But what Greenhouse is, is it's this time for us 
as leaders in the community to come together and to cast vision and to really uh, have deep and meaningful conversations about what it means to uh, be in this transitional liminal season where uh, we're always kind of evolving and these conversations that we have at Greenhouse kind of help to give direction to that and help um, all of our leaders to see in some ways behind the curtain of, of what's happening at Crossings. And then the final thing, we pray a lot at Crossings. We pray um, sometimes using our own words. Uh, and a lot recently, we have been praying using the words of others. And I, I just want to say something about that really quick before we pray at the end. The, the reason that we would pray prayers written by other people is because oftentimes we fall into cliches. We fall into, as individuals, uh, the same language as we approach God in prayer, if you approach God in prayer. Um, and what these written prayers help us to do is train our language. They, they give us new language to approach God and to approach ourselves in some ways. So what we're going to do to end our time together uh, this day is pray a prayer by um, a poet named Douglas McKelvey. And Doug McKelvey wrote a book recently that is a second volume of Every Moment Holy. And this specific volume is about death grief, and hope. But this is the first prayer in that book, and I'd invite you to pray with me uh, in the words that are going to be in yellow on the screen. Would you pray with me? O Spirit of the living God, who raises your people from death to life, the comforting of your children in their hard journeys through the valley of the shadow is from beginning to end your work not mine. I am wholly unfit to enter the holy sufferings of others, to give guidance or true comfort, to speak words of consolation that would name the wounds of dying and grieving hearts or wrap them in compassionate embrace or remind them that there remains a firm eternal hope which will outgrow and outlast death itself. If this is not your work, then I would not have it to be mine. For I would not bid the grieving hang their sorrows or their hopes on any words that cannot bear their weight. So then, take the meager measure of anything that I might give, O God, and bless it for the benefit of your people. Breathe spirit and life into these flawed forms. Let my insufficiencies be met by the multiplying power of your grace. I know I will encounter discouragement in this labor. I know I will often experience the creative process as an impossible struggle against self and darkness. Even so, be at work in and through me, O Lord. I will sometimes falter lose heart, abandon course, and be tempted to turn to diversions and old comforts that cannot sustain. Even so, be at work in and through me, O Lord. On my best days, I might be too confident in my own abilities to recognize the depth of my need, but more often, I will be too empty, too spent, too crippled, by my brokenness to believe I have anything to give. Even so, be at work in and through me, O Lord. In the end, this is my sole means of stewardship, to repeatedly ply the imperfect talents with which you have entrusted me, daily offering to you my poverty, begging you to fill the hollow forms of my offerings. O oh, Holy Spirit, meet, fill, and quicken now these insufficient gifts. Inspire actions that would shepherd and comfort your people, even in their dyings, even in their griefs, voicing their mortal laments and their eternal hopes, gently turning their gaze to the promise of coming resurrection, to the hope 
of a world remade and to the splendor of the King who soon returns to redeem all sorrows. Amen. Now we send one another with that prayer uh, and some sort of action as we play our part in the restoration of all things, as, as we anticipate this king that is going to come to bring uh, resurrection and renewal. And so now we send each other with this word that is about wholeness and peace and reconciliation and restoration praying for one another that we would do that work as we send one another off. Shalom.